Okay. Good morning. So we're drawing to a close. And uh, let me tell you two things before I start. The first one is that uh, what I'm about. Okay, better? Much better. Okay, what, what I'm about to try here, it's an exercise in theory, reconstruction, and theoretical bridges. It's not history of economic thought. And I'm saying that because if by the end of the lecture, you didn't get that you, 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 you will, if you end up with the idea that you had a lecture on the history of economic thought, I would have failed. So I wanna get your feedback on that, okay? The second thing is that the, what we're calling here the Schumpeter Minsky connection is extremely is strong, much stronger than what you would get from reading most of the post-Keynesian post uh, literature. For once, uh, probably most of you know, Minsky was Schumpeter's thesis advisor, and uh, Minsky didn't didn't finish up because with Schumpeter because Schumpeter died, so he finished it with Leontiel. But the influence of Schumpeter on Minsky is huge. It's so huge that I will claim, sort of as a first provocation, that Schumpeter that Minsky is as much a post schumpeterian as he is a post keynesian okay? So that's the roadmap. And the idea is to end up with this sort of a, a synthesis, a framework that combines ideas from Schumpeter, Keynes and Minsky, which was, by the way, precisely what Minsky was claiming in his last years here at Levy as what the future of economic theory should aim at. Okay, let's go. First, Schumpeter's vision. So, Try to look at this definition here. Capitalism is the form of property, private property, in which innovations are carried out by means of board money, which generally implies credit creation. This is a very neat definition, the way I see it. Why? Because it combines in one neat paragraph the production side with the financial side of the economy. It combines innovations, with credit and therefore debt. And that's a, the, the right way, I think, to start thinking about development. And who runs that thing? Well, the financial market does. The money market, but we would say the financial market. It's always at, it's where the headquarter of the capitalist system. So there, there is where the plans for development, or we could add, for the absence of development, it's where they come from. And okay, how this thing gets moved, or gets moving? Credit. The credit system has grown out and tried by financing new combinations. And most important, most important, yeah, uh, to provide credit, is clearly the function of that cate the category of individuals which we call capitalists. So the real capitalists in the systems are the bankers, okay? So this, I would say, let's first sum up here, gives us an idea of how, how strong uh, John Peter's influence was on Minsky. So capitalism, as in Minsky, well, in before Minsky, is seen as primarily a financial system. Credit, institutions, innovation, and competitions are key building blocks of the way the system works. 
Uh, Minsky, famous destabilizing stability, I would say and claim it's inspired by Schumpeter's thesis of capitalism as a victim of its own success, which is in his paper from 1927, and it's developed at length in the capitalism, socialism, and democracy. Uh, the financial stability hypothesis, Minsky's main contribution, it's, it's there in Schumpeter. You, I will try to show that to you. In debtness and reckless banking, those were Schumpeter's uh, concepts. There are key elements in turning recessions into depressions. This is developed in business cycles mostly. Financial innovation, well, that's, I would say, it's Minsky extending Schumpeterian competition to the financial sphere, ex extending the framework from capitalism, socialism, democracy to the financial sphere. But Minsky only started to recognize that influence in his late writings. He, he, he was very, he was silent on Schumpeter for more than, I would say, 20 years. And then around 86, he starts, he start first criticizing heavily Schumpeter, we'll see that, but then he turns and becomes a big fan. It's an interesting way to, an interesting type of evolution. But let's look at this, at Schumpeter's evolution very quickly, and I apologize because I'm going to go to three books very, very quickly because we don't have time to do more than that. So the theory of economic development, business cycles and capitalism, socialism, democracy. The first one, very early publication of Schumpeter, of Schumpeter theory, of, theory, of, theory of economic development is a brilliant book, but it's also an inconsistent book. But well, let's get to the brilliant part first, okay? So innovations are endogenous dynamic forces in the system which periodically destroy, they destroy equilibrium. Money and credit are endogenous and they result from the workings of the financial system. He has a credit theory of money from day one in 1911 or 1912, okay? Credit, not savings, is the key element for investment to take place. And bankers, are the fundamental animal spirits in his system. And why? Because it's their money which is who's at stake. It's not the entrepreneur. It's the banker who's financing the entrepreneur. They're also the ones, because of that, that shape the way uh, the financial structure uh, is going to end up. By what? By selecting what they're going to be funding. What bankers? not the modern bankers, not the modern uh, casino managers, but the old style bankers that Hilferdin talk, talks about, for example, in his financial capital. Please, go ahead. I think of this kind of like uh, financing innovation um, uh, investment taking place in like venture capital nowadays. Is this something that's changed or just like that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. He, uh, Schumpeter's bankers were basically venture capitalists. So he didn't precisely miss completely sort of the financialization thing, but he concentrates on the sort of the productive part of banking in terms of financing the creative part of the creative destruction process. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Then in capitalism, social and democracy, these other financial instruments, they enter the picture. But the key point is that finance still is the driving force. You have other sources of finance, yes. Banks are not so active in managerial capitalism, but finance is still in the, it still is in the driver's seat. Okay? Okay. So that's the book. So capital, as in Marx, but also differently from Marx, is a social relation of production. But it doesn't link as in Marx 
uh, capitalist workers. It links bankers to entrepreneurs. So it's credit. Therefore, as in Marx, capital, capital is control over the productive process. It's always having a dialogue with Marx. The, the whole, the whole of the works, St. Peter's works are in a permanent dialogue, criticizing, but all, also observing a lot of Marx. And he's very explicit about this. In, in capitalism, socialism, democracy. The first session, the first four chapters of the, of the book are about Marx and they are very good uh, sort of evaluation of Marx, both criticizing him, but also praising him. It's a very, I, I would say is a very well balanced analysis of Marx. So profit rates, that's different from every other the economic theory, every theory, postulates that profit rates trend tends to equalize. In Schumpeter, they don't. Why they? Innovations, they come in very different forms, shapes, etc., and they're always disrupting the relationships uh, among firms, etc. There's no, there is no good, valid, theoretical reason why profit rates tend to equalize. The same thing in terms of proportionality in between uh, investments and returns. If I invest more, I, 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 I have bigger returns. No, you can invest a lot and you can go bankrupt. You can invest very little, like what's up, and you can get, get like a big buy from uh, who bought them, uh, Facebook and yeah, for yeah. billions and billions of dollars. So there is not this sort of law at all. And innovations also produce the main conflict embedded in the system, which is not capital versus labor. It's the old versus new. Innovations is the past, all those fi always fighting with the future. Well, I would say those are brilliant uh, statements from 19, again, 12, right? So they are theoretical innovations again. But unfortunately, all in all, and then Minsky gets into the scene, and rightfully so, he says, soon Peter was inconsistent. This was especially evident in his lavish praise, praise of Valha. Minsky is right. Why? Because the whole book is wrapped in equilibrium. It seeks to merge Marx and Valha, evolution with equilibrium, and that cannot be done. Either you are into the, in, in the equilibrium team or you are into the evolution team. You cannot have both. There are different questions, different frameworks, different theoretical structures, and he tries and tries and tries, but this makes the book inconsistent. The analysis starts and ends with equilibrium, so it's not just sort of an expository device. It's something that is in the first chapter, and it is also in the last chapter in the book. With each uh, cycle, well, they begin in equilibrium and they are back to equilibrium in the end. Uh, and the equilibriums, they are destroyed by clusters of innovation. So it seems to be a neat construction, but when you start to ask some questions, the answers are not that good. For example, uh, it's from Peter, I'm reading his own words. In this sense, therefore, we come to, a con to the conclusion that according to our theory, there must be a process of absorption between two booms, ending in a position approaching equilibrium, the bringing about of which is its function. So it's an external function for equilibrium. Recession has a function to disseminate innov the innovation cluster and to restore equilibrium. So what he's telling us is that the invisible hand works. It works through crisis, as in Marx. Marx also resonates like this, cleaning the system and getting the system ready for the next phase, for the next expansion. Therefore, equilibrium is a real feature of the system, which is restored by crisis or actually by recessions, which he, he labels depressions in the first book, and then he corrects himself and he deals with the two concepts, recessions and depressions in business cycles. 
But then the, 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 the crucial question is how equilibrium performs those functions. How, what are the mechanisms through which the equilibrium position, which consists in zero profits, zero interest rate, no debt, no excess demand, full employment, and no entrepreneurs in action, how this thing is restored? There is no answer in the book. So in that sense, it's a brilliant book, but it, it's an inconsistent book at the same time. Business cycles. So we have an exercise in theory reconstruction in order to extract what is interesting from this and reinsert in a different framework. And that's the idea. So business cycles is, it was supposed to be Schumpeter Magnum Opus is a two volume, more than 1000 pages. And he thought it would make him the best economy in the world. It was a disaster in terms of like theoretically speaking, but it has two very interesting things. First class business history. And it also has, and you will see very clearly the seeds of the seeds or maybe more than that of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. Let's go through this quickly, if we can. The underlying theory still is the same, uh, is wrapped in equilibrium, but it gets worse. Why? Because uh, Schumpeter proposes a much more difficult package to digest, which is equilibrium and evolutions within three cycles, the famous Kitchen, Juglar, and Kondratiev. And he uses this to explain the development of capitalism since the Industrial Revolution. But volume one is the more important, but volume two is also important, okay? Um, so the second movement in the book is to try to compress data, statistics, and economic history of more than two and a half centuries into three, the three cycle frameworks with very sparse caution, with no proper theoretical causal links. Uh, and this is proposed like, the, they are not really good in terms of, uh, he is not very good in articulating this and tying the cycles, the three cycles in a coherent way. Example. Uh, in his analysis of the Great Depression, he would say, well, it was really brutal, but it was, the, it, it, it consisted, the explanation is that the three cycles, you had reversion points at the same time. Like severe, it's not a good explanation at all, right? Uh, it didn't work well. The book came, well, maybe fortunately, it came three years after Keynes, which provided a mo much more coherent uh, framework for the analysis of the crisis. And one could keep, well, it's good that the theory came three uh, years before, otherwise the book would be even more like, it, it would be trashed in a much worse way. It was trashed. It was stretched by heavyweights, Schumpeter's uh, colleagues, such as Oscar Lange, Simon Kuznets, Enric Grossman, uh, which is a Marxist, and later on by Minsky himself. And let's get to, let's just get to what Minsky had to say about business cycles, because it's interesting. It is a retrogression from his previous book, The Theory of Economic Development. The three cycles, well, what I just said, completely agree with Minsky. The three cycles, uh, they are mechanical and the vast presentation of data is numbing rather than enlightening. The crisis of capitalism evoked the magnificent theoretical performance from Keynes. Schumpeter's response was banal. The difference of import of Keynes and Schumpeter over 50 years since the accumulation of the crisis uh, is that Keynes interpret 1933 as a source for repudiating prior theories, whether Schumpeter interpret events as reinforcing 
the basic validity of her, his earlier views. Yeah, it's absolutely right. But then we have Thomas Macraw, uh, fantastic uh, business historian, which led, along with Alfred Schindler Jr., the Harvard Business School effort in terms of analyzing capitalism from an historical perspective. He wrote a fantastic biography of Schumpeter as well. Then he has something interesting to say. He says, well, business cycles agreeing with everybody else that wrote before him. Business cycles was Schumpeter's least successful book measured by its professed aims and several other uh, yardsticks. Yet, the book has two vital aspects that have, have been largely overlooked. First, it caused a significant change in Schumpeter's thinking about capitalism. It moved him to a more historical and empirical approach. And he's right. The historical chapters in business cycles are great. And this is what he has to say. Much of the book, those chapters, consists uh, or constitutes a preview of modern, rigorous business history. And he himself, along with uh, Chandler and others, they pursued that avenue, very much influenced by Schumpeter. And Harvard's uh, famous case study method is a hear of this type of business history. And Schumpeter himself was involved in the foundation of the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies in Harvard. So it's an interesting sort of link. And this is, uh, this is uh, Macraw's book, which I highly recommend, Profit of Innovation. It's very well written and well researched. Okay, but then there is a second thing that I think I am claiming here, I haven't seen this uh, claim before, which is that not all theory is lost. There is something, it's called the secondary wave, is buried in the fourth chapter of uh, Business Cycles, volume one, one, and it basically describes innovation diffusion, because innovation, you have two, two strokes, right? Uh, introduction and diffusion. And when he does that, very few, very few people took the trouble of reading through all like the book, the two volumes of business cycles. We, if one reads that, one gets surprised. If you didn't get very much of what Steve Fazari, because he went very quickly to, the, to this sequence, Minsky's sequence in terms of getting from hedge to speculative, to Ponzi, which is the basis of his financial instability hypothesis, okay? So pay attention, okay? This is Schumpeter. If innovations are being embodied in new plant and equipments, additional innovation diffusion, he's describing how innovations diffuse to the system. And this is crucial for what? For productivity, for growth. And he also describes the whole process as a financial process. If innovations are being embodied in new plant and new equipment, additional consumer spending will result practically as quickly as additional producers spending. Two things are then practically sure to happen. First, old firms will react to this situation. And second, many of them will speculate on this situation. Chapter four, what he's saying here, the Keynesian multiplier, but understood also as a financial process, also as something that starts a speculative uh, wave in the economy. Let's go. In doing this, many people will act on the assumption, translate, on the expectation that rates of change they observe will continue indefinitely and enter into transactions that will result in losses as soon as facts fail to verify that expectation. New borrowing will then no longer be confined to entrepreneurs and deposits will be created to finance the general expansion. Each loan tending to induce another loan, each rise, uh, each rise in price. 
what he's saying there. From financial speculation, he's pointing the way to financial bubbles. Translate, expansion breeds financial fragility. Once a prosperity got under sale, households will borrow for purposes of consumption in the expectation that actual incomes will permanently be what they are or they will increase. Business will borrow merely to expand all lines in the expectations that this demand will persist or increase. Farms will be bought at prices at which they could pay only if the prices of agricultural products kept their level or increased. Are you being reminded of 2008, 2007, or 29? Yes, you should. So what he's telling us now, well, he's pointing the way from financial fragility, the way it develops into financial instability and then into economic instability. Finally, the speculative position is likely to contain many untenable elements, which the slightest impairment of the values of collateral will bring down. Part of the debt structure will, will crumble, freezing credits, shrinkage, shrinking deposits, and all of the rest follow in due course. Okay, financial instability develops into financial crisis and, to, and into economic crashes. And then I think one of you could be thinking, sounds like Minsky? I would say, yes, it is Minsky. This is where the financial instability hypothesis was born. It was not in Keynes. It's here, and I'm showing to you. So Schumpeter is a very much a post, sorry, Minsky is very much a post schumpeterian if not more, than a post keynesian This is the financial instability hypothesis. And then we get to his big turn, the book, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. And I follow, I'm following the great Nathan, Nathan Rosenberg, who wrote, he gave this paper at, the, at Kyoto, uh, at the Schumpeter Society a meeting. I was there, was lucky enough to be there. And he's telling us, it is my intention to show that the quintessential late Schumpeter of 42 had views that are, were not only radical, but deserve far more serious attention than they receive today. He was in a Schumpeter meeting, so he was provoking everybody in the room. Today, even, or perhaps especially, from scholars who think of themselves as working within the Schumpeterian tradition. Be why? Because it's a big rupture. With what? With Schumpeter's pre this theoretical framework. The news here, I would say, this is where the creative destruction paradigm is born. And it's the first book where he actually uses the expression this, either in business cycles or in economic development. And what he's telling us, well, capitalism is turmoil. Like, uh, it cannot be stationary. So don't think about equilibrium. Forget it. It is necessary being revolutionized from within by new enterprise, which means economic progress in a capitalist society means turmoil. That's the book. So what are the theoretical advances there? First of all, there are no, no more cycles, no more regular well-behaved cycles. Competition, creative destruction, replaces cycles as the linchpin of the system dynamics. Creative destruction is an open-ended process which is filled with uncertainties. There is no end point as the previous cycles had. Equilibrium is gone. Perfect competition is completely thrown away and labeled as basically inefficient if it ever came to exist. Schumpeter is self-criticizing when, when he says that. 
And super profits are often, not always, but often they are the seeds of super investments. So bigness is efficient. It provides growth and it provides a win-win solution in which capitalists gain because profits go up, workers gain because real wages go up, prices go down in the long term, consumers gain because you have more variety, you have uh, 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 lower prices, and you have better quality, and the government gains because fiscal revenues, uh, they, 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 they go up. So it's a win-win solution. Everybody can be well off. And what about monopolistic prices, the oligo oligopolistic, the uh, oligopoly models that we all get inside micro two or micro three or micro four or micro five or whatever? Well, they basically will tell, well, imperfect competition is really not that good. What is really good is perfect competition. Well, Sean Peter is like claiming the reverse. No, bigness is efficient and monopolistic prices are not exactly what the, the strategies, meaning price fixing, markup, markup manipulation, protecting mark, market, market niches, patenting, all those things, they are common because they are the things that uh, corporations use in order to compete. And that's the way they fight each other. It's not only a price game, it's a much more complex, complex game. So they are, in a way, they are the name of the game. And involuntary unemployment and plan, planned idle capacity are the norms. Perfect competition is labeled as textbook fiction. And this book documents the, so, so let's call it this, the Schumpeterian Corporation. That's one of the many books that the, the Chandler crowd, Macro included, uh, produced, documenting this in several countries. This one, I think, is US, UK, uh, Germany, and Japan. It's a good book to look at. So investment opportunities are constantly recreated by innovations. So uh, what kind of innovations? All types of innovations play a part. Products, processes, financial, organization, legal, institutional, radical, incremental. He's providing us with a general theory of competition, which I will say is something that economic theory doesn't have. A, a, a really strong theory of competition. The only one I know is this, Schumpeterian competition. It still has to be much better developed, but it's the only one that really works. And development itself unfolds in waves cumulative technological revolutions that rejuvenate, constantly rejuvenate the economic landscape. Good book, a very good book on that is Mokir, The Level of Riches. Uh, and the subtitle tells all, Te Technological Creativity and Economic Progress. And then we get to institutions, which is, let's say, Schumpeter's economic sociology and why they are so important. Because with equilibrium out, what stabilizes the system? Because if you have equilibrium, you just see towards equilibrium and we're done. We can leave the room. Well, no, equilibrium is not there anymore. We have turmoil, but the system doesn't explode. Why? Well, because institutions, they came in, they're always there to provide. It's not an assured thing, but they are there to provide in stability, economic and social and political stability. But the concern is more with economic stability here. So stability is an institutional construct and is not, of course, a natural feature of the economic system. Stability is achieved through institutional adaptation, shared expectations, corporate governance, rules, regulations, and policy interventions. A lot of, uh, this is a book that Swedberg uh, edited in the 90s, and it has some essays that were not available in English until then. And he explores this in a very good way, maybe better even than in the book in the 40s, uh, Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. So it's a, it's a good read on, the, on his take on institutions. So the core message here is that they are institutions. They are the tools, the main tools for building stability in a creative destruction environment. 
So stability, however, is not an assured feature of the system, but rather is the result of a very complex set of shared expectations, legal organization, and policy arrangements. However, again, if these institutions, institutional constellations are not updated, constantly updated, they tend to become outdated, meaning dysfunctional, and de therefore destabilizing rather than stabilizing. So it's a very subtle and complex construction. The core message I would say is that institutional adaptation has to be a constant in the system. System evolves, institutions have to evolve uh, in a parallel way. If they don't, they become dysfunctional. One of the biggest, biggest examples, Glass-Steagall Act. It went in in the 30s, it stayed until it became so dysfunction that so dysfunctional that it, it was it has it was more or less internally like demolished before the of 99. So the alternative in terms of regulation would be dynamic regulation. You have to keep changing the rules because the corporations, and it's the financial corporations, they, they keep innovating and they keep changing their own strategies. This is a very good book, Schumpeter and the Idea of Social Science, Yuki Chionoya, that explores the whole idea of uh, institutions and stability as well. So, finishing up with, with this part, uh, capitalism is neither as harmonious, so not the neoclassical crowd, but it's not also bound to economic collapse, not the Marxist crowd as well. It's a victim of its own success, okay? Why is this? Well, I don't have time to, this is like chapters 10 to 14 in Captain Social and Democracy. It's a very interesting way of uh, analyzing the increasing institutional dysfunctionality, including not only economic variables, but also political and cultural transformations. If you want one phrase, to describe this process is a very complex analysis. Economic and political institutional rationalities, they tend to clash. And this, so it's, again, it's not because capitalism is weak, economically speaking, it's strong. But the whole, uh, he, he makes a distinction in between the capitalist system and the capitalist order. In that tends to become dysfunctional because it's where the institutions reside. And you have a clash of rationalities uh, coming from the economic sphere and coming from sort of the, what he calls order. Uh, a good book on that is this book from Bokland, Modernization and Its Political Consequences. He goes through Weber, Mannheim, and from Peter. The book, it's a good book to look at. And then we get to from Peter and Minsky, okay? Only there. So Minsky, the three books, the must-reads, are the three ones that you already uh, know about and or perhaps read. Uh, John Manet Keynes, the collection of essays, uh, Can It Happen Again? And finally, the Stabilizing an Unstable Economy. Okay? So Minsky's big turn comes in 96, as I said in the beginning. Uh, he, he, he goes from harsh critic, you saw it, to a big fan. And what he's telling us here, Schumpeter and Keynes are compatible for, for they both define the problem of economics as uh, the analysis of a monetary production economy. Financial entrepreneurship and therefore financial evolution are central to Schumpeter's vision of the process of economic development. Innovations in financial relations since World War II validates this interpretation of Schumpeter's vision. From Peter's bankers, finance, your point for earlier, finance the creative part of creative destruction. The Schumpeterian banker is not our own day's master of the corporate ride and leverage buyout. He's very clear on that. Okay. The economic theory, and that's the point, the economic theory that integrates Schumpeter and Keynes, which unifies what is usually called the real and the financial, 
improves our understanding of capitalist economy. The economic theory, this economic theory was not available and is not available. I think Minsky was trying to get into it in his uh, last years, uh, less, less productive years, okay? Uh, this is uh, from Peter Finance and Evolution, 1990, okay? So he is here surprisingly generous and sympathetic. Recall his comments on business cycles and on Keynes and Schumpeter. And by the way, it's quite strange that Minsky never mentioned that the, origin, the uh, origins of his financial instability hypothesis are so clearly stated in business cycles. I, I, after all, he was a student of Schumpeter. He must have read business cycles. It's a puzzle. To me, it's a puzzle. I'll leave it there. Uh, so let's get to the Schumpeter-Minsky connection. Uh, Schumpeter's basic model, we can frame it like that, okay? We got finance, we have to have finance and entrepreneurship first. And so, and only after that, after you have that, that, that interaction, you get into competition by means of innovation, competition and innovation, okay? Uh, and then you have creative destruction which is, consists in geographical dislocations, profits, conflicts, and you have structural changes as a result. And this is uh, subjected to a policy and to an institutional framework that are not discussed in the sort of the, the, the raw model. If we jump to Minsky, we can do something very similar. There we have finance, which leverage debt, debt financial innovation, liquidity creation, and we have investment which is a good thing, right? Uh, those uh, uh, productive, productive capacity, asset building, effective demand, uh, positive cash flows, employment. But this also brings with, with itself, uh, besides funding and hedging instruments, it brings profits for firms, it, being, it brings financial rents for financial corporations, but it also brings financial fragility. So, and also you have a policy and a very clear, even more clear than in Schumpeter, a policy and an institutional framework uh, sort of shaping this project. And as a result, you have growth and destabilizing stability. If we do it more or less the same process from a different angle, I think we catch something interesting. The relationship uh, First from Peter, credit, innovation, competition, and creative destruction. Let, let, let's depart from the same uh, sort of source, credit and innovation. And what's creative destruction? Okay, the creative part is here. Economic rejuvenation, profits, rents, productivity goes up, efficiency goes up, uh, real wages goes up. What, 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 what's the destructive part? Bankruptcies, you have it. Financial losses, economic obsolescence, unemployment, uh, not general unemployment, but unemployment in certain sectors, the ones that are being destroyed, and social and regional dislocations. And you have structural change, and you have also resistances to innovation, both coming from the future, uncertainty, because you don't know if what you're gonna do is gonna work out or not. So innovation is a very difficult process always, it's not easy. And you have resistances from the past, both from sort of routines that are already in place, and it's very hard to break a routine and go to something completely new. And you have also uh, resistances if you have financial commitments. You can have very good ideas, but you are completely in debt then maybe you, ha you don't have access to finance. So you have resistances for coming from the future and coming from the past. But the main message is that change, again, is turmoil. Pressures, conflicts, turmoil. Then you get, we, we get to Minsky and we can do something similar, I think, I, I'm proposing here. Well, uh, what's the, let's call it financial creative destruction. What is the sort of, the creative part, the good part. Well, we have better hedging, you have better finance, better funding, and obviously better prospects in terms of investment. Better pro prospects in terms of profits and rents, and you have more liquidity and you lower the transaction costs in the whole system. What's the bad part? What's the, 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 
the part B of this whole thing. Well, you also have at the same time, speculation goes up, leverage goes up, risk goes up, uncertainty goes up. As a result, over indebtedness uh, starts to, to grow. Financial imbalances start to grow. Financial transparency goes down and regulatory capacity also shrinks. And you have the path towards financial fragility and to potential financial instability. And you have, as a result, a financially fragile and unstable growth, okay? Uh, what is the interesting thing here, I think? And you have this, this which is really important. There was not very much uh, discussed here. Financial regulation. Financial regulation is really important. And the problem is that it tends to be looking at the past, past-oriented, while the financial firm's strategies are future-oriented. And if you take Minsky like that, I'm going to suggest to you, you have some a sort of what I'm, what I'm trying to summarize here. Competition in the financial sphere. Those are some of the effects. If you take that approach, you have an endogenous way of describing the passage from speculative, from hedge to speculative to Ponzi. Because some of the critics will say, well, Minsky doesn't explain. It's sort of external shocks that makes the position, the, the, the hedge position goes to speculative and goes to Ponzi. But if you take a sort of a competition within the financial sphere, the competition in itself will tend to bring those results from a very much endogenous uh, perspective. And obviously the exogenous, well, for example, uh, uh, interest, interest rate rise or something with exchange rate, is this exogenous? I'm not sure, the central bank independencies is one thing. The exogenous force, I would say probably not. But even though, if you want to say, okay, the central bank is going to uh, let, let us take it as an exogenous force, even though if you, if you work out competition within the financial sphere, you end up with these results, endogenously, like as a, as a sort of endogenous process. And again, you have more or less the same result, change, uh, uh, links to pressures, to conflicts, and to financial uh, fragility. And then before uh, heading out to my conclusions, let's pause a bit to uh, take a look at Eric's uh, lecture, The Varieties of Capitalism. Okay, So we have here, I think, two Minsky's, two versions of Minsky. This I would call the sequences versus the stages, right? The sequence is this, that, the financial fragility and unstable growth. How do you get there? Well, you have hedge, then it's the familiar one. You have from hedge to speculative to Ponzi, and then you have the path towards economic instability and financial crashes, okay? And then you have the other way that Eric presented, which is not the sequences, but the stages, which is commercial capitalism, finance capitalism, managerial capitalism, and money manager capitalism. And the question that might arise from that is, well, is this a road towards increasing financial fragility? Well, the first and quick answer would say, of course not, because managerial capitalism was very stable as compared to what was there before and what was there after. But this is, is more speculation than real research. Uh, the book, the, 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 the good book on this is the one that Eric and, and Randy wrote, The Rise and Fall of Money Manager Capitalism. But he only investigates and discusses two of the stages, and mostly in the US, okay? So uh, money manager uh, and managerial capitalism. So I have some questions that I, was, I, I would like to just pose. I'm not going to be answering them, but I think this deserves some interesting questions. First, 
what's the relationship between the stages and the sequences in Minsky? Do we have a Minsky one and a Minsky two here? Two to, to different ways of conceiving the way the system evolves? Or more to the point, does the sequence hedge, speculative Ponzi, does this, this applies to all stages of capitalism, capital and financial evolution? It's not clear because nobody developed that, okay? Are Minsky stages general or they are basically US centric? My answer, US centric. He's not looking at other financial systems, which leads me to propose that in terms of extending, which is a very interesting insight, the stages approach is, oh, you can understand a lot of how capitalism evolves by looking at the evolution of its financial structures. This is a really interesting uh, insight that gets us to look very carefully to financial history. And I think future research should focus on linking varieties of financial structures. For instance, what about East Asia? What about Scandinavia? What about Germany? What about Canada? What about South America? Different financial structures and tie them to different modes of financial governance. And then you end up probably, most likely, being able to discuss more stable financial systems versus less stable financial systems. I think it's a very good way to go. It's not there. It's something that you can grab and go and develop. And three books that I would just point out that tell very interesting stories about commercial capitalism. The first one, Capitalism take, Takes Control. is a collection of essays, and it tells the story of commercial capitalism here in the US. And you'll be amazed of how unstable this type of capitalism was, okay? And how uh, slaves were used as collateral, and they would be secretized more or less, and they would, uh, uh, loans to the farmers, uh, collateral will be slaves, the slaves will become sort of the collateral for a, a, a secu security, securitized contracts that would be commercialized and sold by Bering, Bering's Bank from London to the whole Europe. So not that dissimilar to what happened in sort of previously to 2007, 2008. The, the other one, the making of modern, modern fi finance by a guy come, a professor called Samuel Nafu, it tells the story in England. And he also uh, looks at how so unstable and with uh, a lot, how much financial fragility was there. And it tells the story of how the Bank of England came in to more or less stabilize both the relationships in between the bank and the, the crown, the government, but also to stabilize what was a very, uh, a very undisciplined, to say the least, financial system uh, before the whole thing got got got, got uh, more coherently uh, structured, which was only in the I don't know mid uh, mid nineteenth century, if not later. And this last book, Finance Capitalism and Germany's Rise to Power, tells us a very different story of financial or finance or financial capitalism in Germany. It's not the same in, as in the U.S. In the US is what uh, the roaring 20s, et cetera, is very unstable, okay? In Germany, not necessarily. It's not what Hilferding describes in financial capital. It's not what uh, David Lundes describes so well in the Unbound Prometheus, which is a fantastic book about technological change and industrial and, and economic progress as well. Uh, and he tells a different story the banks and the relationship in between the banks and the firms and what happened in Germany was not the same. So what I'm telling you is that really this stages uh, approach is interesting, but it has to be developed. It's not developed yet, okay? We would gain with that, but it also should not be US-centric, okay? And I 
go to my conclusion, which is precisely the idea of suggesting you a very raw, let's say, a departure point of a framework that integrates ideas of Schumpeter, Keynes, and Minsky. So that would go more or less like that. Capitalism is a historical process in which change, not equilibrium, is the most relevant feature. Change, not equilibrium, should therefore be the main object of investigation in any program. In that system, economic agents are creative, not adaptive. And firms are the main, both financial firms and industrial or non-financial firms, are the main economic units in terms that they are the agents of transformation. Competition, understood as a rivalry among firms and as, as well as a selection mechanism, is the engine that propels economic change. Innovations are the main fuel of that engine. Credit and innovations together, they function both at the same time as levers of riches and as an uncertainty creators. And therefore, their interplay is at the root of the system, twin operating features, progress and conflict. Again, turmoil. Financial innovations are central to financial evolution, yet they're also key to understand unstable and financially fragile and often financially un unsustainable development processes. Financial fragility springs from the relationship among financial innovation, indebtedness, cash flows, and uncertainty. Profit rates tend to differentiate, not equalize, and no proportionality law between investment and profits applies. Institutions and public policy are the main tools for building stability through the establishments of conventions, rules, uh, regulations, and policy interventions that will cre create regularities and conversions of expectations. Therefore, or however, like I said before, those regularities and stability are not fixed, but rather an evolving result of complex institutional arrangements and policy measures, which can turn into destabilizing forces, again, in a creative, not in an equilibrium, but in a creative destruction uh, environment. Finally, I didn't get much into that, but you can charge me in the Q&A if you, if you want. Mm -hmm. States, and more precisely, entrepreneurial states are pillars of develop, su successful development processes because among other things, they stabilize expectations, they provide funding, they speed innovation, and they facilitate entrepreneurial collective action. East Asia is the biggest sort of set of lessons that we can get in order to understand uh, this. And Schumpeter is big on that in the socialism part of capitalism, socialism and democracy. But he has, uh, he has, uh, he has fascinating passages in the other books, especially business cycles, talking about the state and how important the state was in order to create capitalism. And this goes back to his pamphlet of 1918, the crisis of the tax state. So it's there in Schumpeter, but it's not in his model. Okay. And finally, finally, the main causal chain in the operation of that system runs from policymakers, money managers, and entrepreneurs' decisions to the determination of investment, technological change, productivity, growth, and employment. So this is again a very much like simplified departure point, a suggested departure point for a framework that integrates the productive, the production side and the financial side, innovations and financial fragility, growth, structural transformation, but also turmoil.
Okay. If you want to get a little more into that, on Schumpeter, there is this. On Minsky, there is this Elgar Companion, very interesting essays. And this is a book that I edited with a colleague, which tries to update the analysis of the capitalism, socialism, and democracy, and bringing to a more sort of modern uh, or contemporary environment. And I thank you. I'm ready. Did I fail? Yes. Questions? Critics? Gentile critics? Go ahead. Um, it's clear that that um, you know the, the sort of economic boom and bust cycles have been um, you know usually linked with some sort of innovation, which which, which empirically would support some of, some of these theses. I wonder, like, was the like the 2008 financial crisis? Can we call that like a, a the innovate the underlying innovation there just a financial innovation, or was there like, like, like I, I, I can look, you know, you can look back and say, okay, like, you know, the, the innovation of railroads in, in the 19th century called caused like a big boom and bust. Um, you know, but more recently, like the shale revolution, um, you know, a, a big boom, boom, boom and bust. Was the financial crisis just primarily a financial innovation that didn't have anything to do with any real technolo technological innovation? I have a good question. I think technological innovations they will move the system in a, in a not very harmonious way. So turmoil is the rule. But in order to get to a crisis, you have to link it to the way the financial system works. You can't understand a crisis without understanding the problems that Minsky highlights. Some Peter as well, but Minsky highlights in terms of, okay, this is how, how, how the production side relates to the financial side and how private debt and debt within the financial system, how these things, how did they work? When you get there, then you start to understand the dynamics of a crisis. In that sense, any crisis is a financial crisis, yes. Okay. You? Yeah. So it can be a very beginner question. But like economic analysis, or at least in my country, economic analysis and especially business people are really like talking about creative disruption. And then especially like when they when the economy faces a certain kind of talk, like pandemic, they are using the creating disruption as the reason that when they explain like high bankruptcy like with the crisis, and then so like I think what they need to imply is that you know the government don't have to save like especially like small and medium enterprises because that is it is kind of sort of necessary for them to you know go to the background under this kind of severe crisis situation. I think that they they want to say something like that. But what what do you think about that? This kind of the view. I mean the what. That Schumpeter will agree this kind of the view. Can you summarize the view? It's that oh. the crisis is create is yeah. basically creative destruction and creative destruction, and then the, you know so the for the especially like small and medium enterprises, I you know highly for the bankrupt under these circumstances, right? And then so what they want to say is like because it is a creative destruction phase. So the government don't have to save those companies. Mm, it's a very good question. Schumpeter would partially agree with that in a way that, okay, uh, there is a role for the cleaning process that creative destruction brings about. However, when, because of the financial dimension of creative destruction, which he describes in the secondary wave, the process can go much further and be much more deleterious, can be, can, can, can be much more wasteful than what it should. 
And in this case, Schumpeter will, will say explicitly, no, the government has to step in because this is not a, a, a sort of a, a well-behaved recession, which would be, let's say, uh, therapeutic. It became a pathological process called a depression. Therefore, the government has to, to step in, okay? So we would not agree completely with that. Uh, yes, uh, going back to your discussion of uh, 1939 theory of the business cycles. Yeah. Uh, you said that, uh, uh, Schumpeter, you, you mentioned three types of cycles. I believe they were Kitchen, Jugler, and- Kondrachev. Kondrachev. Now, actually, I've only heard of the third of those three types of cycles. I don't even know what the other two are. So it, it, you could briefly explain what they are. But also, um, uh, did, was it Schumpeter who introduced the, the, and gave names to these three different concepts? The what? Was it Schumpeter who, in this, this book in 39, gave names to these three types of cycles? No, no, no. Did they already exist as economic concepts? Yeah, they already existed. The Kondrachev would be a sort of a 40 to 50 year long cycle. The, the juglar seven years, more or less seven, eight years, and the kitchens would be like 40 months or so. Uh, I really don't like that because it's too much regularity in the system. So uh, there was never really good uh, statistical uh, validation of this. There are very, very critical articles in terms of each of these cycles, and especially this, the, 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 the worst of this is trying to combine the three cycles in a very loose way, which is the way that Schumpeter does in business cycles. And those names were already there. Kitchens is the guy who identified the first, the, the, the 40 months, Shuglar, the one in Kondrachev. So the names are, are we were there, and Schumpeter tried to combine them. It would have been very nice if it really worked in terms of like it, if it was empirically adherent and it could explain, it, it, it doesn't match. The historical chapters, they really don't match with the sort of theoretical structure. That's one of the biggest problems of the book. Yeah, uh, so I'm curious your thoughts on the role of fraud in financial instability and whether fraud is a distinct thing, sort of speculative, well-meaning speculative uh, Ponzi, or, or is it such a, a spectrum that you can call anything kind of in that area? So. Again, as almost everything in economics, it depends. Depends on the regulatory structure. But I would say in a Ponzi situation, I think fraud is, is very much part of the whole thing. It's central. In the speculative positions, you can have it. Yeah. I, I, would, I wouldn't put the whole weight of the explanation of what a speculative process is into fraud. When you migrate to Ponzi, you are in, a, in, in, fraud, in fraud territory, as we saw in 2007, 2008, okay? Just that, I don't have much more to say about that. <laughs> no, you, yeah, go ahead. Um, one, uh... One common element that I that I noticed in the in the three thinkers, the uh, economy that you developed in, in your presentation is the endogeneity of prices. And this, at least to, to my understanding, goes back to, to, to Marx, that there is this propensity of the, the capitalist economy to read yep. prices. But I'm wondering whether one of the three, uh, some of some of these thinkers contest, challenge this um, this uh, norm that uh, crises are endogenous to capitalism. Because I'm thinking that uh, in, the, in the history of the 20th century, in the big crisis, we can see that economic um, economic turmoil is often the outcome of uh, political uh, changes and transformations in the international system. So, kind of exogenous. No, yeah. absolutely. I think, I think the OE crisis yeah. and the OPEC in the 70s or early before World War. One and and how it led to a long period of uh, all of them will, will, would agree with you what you're saying. 
what they would say is that, okay, those are exogenous factors that can bring about crisis. What they would disagree is with the neoclassical proposition that, well, absent that, the system tends to stability. That's the problem. They would say, no, even if you don't have wars, if you don't have COVID, if you don't have anything like that, OPEC, the system will produce endogenously, endogenously it will produce crisis. It's inherently unstable. That would be their point, which doesn't exclude external sources of crisis, okay? They can both exist and they do exist, but the system is inherently unstable. That would be the main point for the three of them and for Marx. Yeah. Yes, you, you go then, bye. No, first, first but you go ahead and then... You... Yeah, so, um, you know, in, in the financial instability hypothesis and, and how it kind of plays out, um, uh, you know, from... from the, Speak a little bit, or, or the, take it out, or whatever. Yeah, so, from the, you know, you have the crash of 29 and the Great Depression, and and then you have all the New Deal banking reforms and that kind of stabilizes the system and it kind of like takes all the way until 2008 the system to really get into crisis again. Um, and now this time um, it's, you know, like we didn't have a great depression really. Like the, the, the fallout from the crisis was a lot less severe and the, um, and the, the banking reforms and, and, and everything like that seem like a lot less um you know trans like strict and transformative and they're already starting to be undone um do you see this uh as like you know tending to it, it, i mean it seems like because the the crisis wasn't as severe this time the the, the kind of like reset wasn't as as uh complete and so it seems like it's already like maybe it's already like um eroding the stability, destabilizing or eroding the stability already, do you, do you see that as likely to produce a, a, another crisis soon this time? What I see is that first, uh, policymakers did learn from the previous crisis that so the role of government became much bigger and the role both the what Minsky would call big government and the big bank, the, the central bank. So this, in a way, this sort of act as a buffer on the whole system. On the other hand, it really maintained uh, an unhealthy dose of financial fragility in the system that wasn't taken away completely. So since at least 2008, we didn't eliminate a financial fragility. This is something that maybe could be developed in terms of adding a third process to the two processes that Minsky describes and analyzes: financial fragility and how it migrates. He doesn't do he doesn't do it in a very neat way, but it's clearly there. Financial fragility, it migrates to fr towards financial instability, and financial instability is really the, it, it, it happens inside the financial system and is the culprit of financial crashes, okay? Maybe a third process could be added, which would be a asset liability restructuring process, which takes time. So it's not that the big bank goes there and, the big, and they clean everything, and the system is ready for the next round. It's clearly not. It's still there, and you have a lot of waste in the system. So this is a question that I think is important and not very well developed. But don't forget, you said, we jumped from 29 to 2008, and we didn't have prices. Oops, look at Latin America. Look at uh, Eastern Europe. You, we had crises. Look at Asian crises in the 90s. We had a lot of crises, just not in the U.S. We had 2000 here and we had 2008, but it wasn't exactly a, a, a peaceful world, peaceful world in terms of not having crisis. We had the, we had the savings and loan crisis. Precisely, which was big, right? Yeah. It was enormous. Exactly, yeah. And, and, and 
Yeah. To stop the problem. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. They put people in jail. Yeah, yeah, we did a, lot. a lot. A lot, a lot. Yeah, yeah. In 2009, 2010, no one went to jail. I think it was like something like Bill Black talks about Yeah, yeah, no, true, true. Which we, we gets us into fraud, right? Yeah, but go ahead. Your, your, your. My question is, uh, we observed the last decade uh, a very uh, low interest rate environment uh, that provided loose terms of credit to many entrepreneurs. Do you think that in the Shubiterian way uh, of thinking, this could be detrimental because it can maintain zombie firms uh, by providing uh, credit to them and uh, delaying the cleansing process um, to allow the entrepreneur that they are more uh, innovative to thrive and uh, survive? Yeah, probably yes, and even more than that very low interest rates, they can be very dangerous from the perspective of financial fragilization. Why? Because, yeah, because you use very low interest rates in order to speculate and leverage yourself. And that's not a very good thing, right? So yes, I think that you would not like very much this. Please. The, the, the low rates for entrepreneurs, say, since 2008 are, or there's information hidden in that because there's statistics, uh, business dynamics statistics that that, that that we collect that show that the who is we who is we you work for uh, the, I, I work at the small business administration. Okay, okay, okay. Related. So okay, there's even though there's low interest, it doesn't mean that a bunch of people are getting credit to start businesses. You're right. Certain people are getting credit yeah. to start business. Almost yeah. all, because it's not cash flow based lending, it's asset based lending. Okay. If you have no assets, which many people ended up with no assets after 2008, 2009, you're not going to get a loan. It's that simple. And I'm talking anywhere from a small little micro loan of $25,000 up to $5 million. These are the small businesses. So even though there's low interest rates, it doesn't mean there's business formation. Yeah, and right. Certain people can get business formation. And of course, there's been the- Most likely the wrong people. The wrong people. And, yeah. there's this, and there's this idea that entrepreneurship is Silicon Valley and the, the next unicorn. When in fact, most small businesses are not that and they're not financed with venture capital. Most businesses are actually bootstrapped. Yeah. Dito, I agree. Thanks. Any other question? Any other? Oh, yeah, please. If I remember correctly on your slide, the vein, the computer, Keynes, Minsky, um, like the framework, the government at, and the state is seen as a pillar of innovation. Uh, but when I think of like uh, when the East Asian countries episode 1970s, 80s, uh, their financial regime was pretty much repressed yeah. and also growth modeling, not uh, like innovation based, but rather it's capital investment based. So how can we justify that claim that state is kind of pillar of innovation within those? Uh, well, uh, you could claim that at first you didn't have radical innovation coming from those countries at first but their the their the entrepreneurial or the developmental state in asia did a fantastic job in terms of what innovation diffusion and for shun peter the innovation process consists in two phases which are equally important innovation introduction of innovation in innovation diffusion. And what South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, uh, Singapore, all those countries did, excelled in doing it, was innovation diffusion and creative imitation. So they did it very well. After one generation, they started, as you probably know well, they started to do it by themselves. They started to excel in what, what, what is today called primarily innovation. Right, but China is doing right now, and the state was always a big player, if not the biggest player there. So that's why I'm saying that the entrepreneurial state is a sort of a very important dimension 
of this of analyzing successful developmental development processes it's not very well tied to the schumpeterian model but it is there in schumpeter there is one chapter in that book the the one that i edited with the colleague uh schumpeter for the 21st century where i tried to do this sort of operation to bring the state into schumpeter's model and apply that to china and to, to 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 try to show that china has a very well developed entrepreneurial state and this response not to all but to a lot of china's crazy uh, trajectory in terms of speed and success etc in like 40 years they went from a very poor nation to the second and with a fantastic process of social inclusion as well it was not only progress in itself but progress within with, with social inclusion so this is again something that has to be developed but i think it's a it's a frontier team but it, it's consistent with that framework it's not there completely developed but it is consistent okay all good thank you